Midwestern. Right. Well, well we, <laughs> yes, we have a good friend. Who's right. Yeah. That's Actually, good. my. No, I'm letting somebody in, but I also had to start the recording. Uh, <laughs> Ann Gardner Perkins is an award-winning historian and an expert in higher education. She graduated from Yale University, where she won a Porter Prize in History and was elected the first woman editor-in-chief of the Daily New Yale Daily News. Perkins is a Rhodes Scholar who received her PhD in higher education from the University of Mass Massachusetts, Boston, and her master's in public administration from Harvard, where she won a Linauer? Litauer. Litauer award for academic excellence and served as a teaching fellow in education policy. She has presented papers on the history of higher education at a leading academic at leading academic conferences and has been a visiting scholar at the New England Resource Center for Higher Education. Perkins lives with her husband in Boston or wherever it is. Yeah, <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> we don't need complicated. Yeah. Um, how many of you had a chance to finish the book? I'm not questioning. I'm not questioning. Okay. How many of you listened to the book? I listened to it, and I have one piece of feedback for you. Sure. I pronounce it New Haven, yes. not New Haven. Yeah. And the person who narrated it says New York or New Haven. And it started to, <laughs> but you know what, Her, the audio was great. The, the person who did the narration was fabulous, except when she said, New Haven. <laughs> it drove me crazy. You know, it's funny because, um, wait, let, let her go. Okay. When, before she started doing it. Hang on. Okay. One at a time. We do talk one at a time. That's all right. Um, she sent me a list of all the words she didn't know how to pronounce. And so I sent her a tape, but she didn't send me New Haven. And, and then yeah. I, <laughs> I would have told her how to pronounce New Haven. But, the, but, but it is a really great way of approaching the book. It is yeah. a really great way of, of listening. And, um, and so yeah. everybody else here read it. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. What's I, fun stuff. I needed oh. to read it. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. What's fun about the audio is at the end, we put clips of some of my original interviews with the women in the book. Oh. And so that was kind of fun. Um, but, yeah. Anyway. Anyway, no. We're say no I said New Haven. Yeah. Not New Haven. <laughs> You're and I didn't know. She's from Canada. I know. Exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. I've been saying it wrong all along. I've been here for 22 years. You're Canadian. Yeah. Canadian. Everybody's been whispering about you. <laughs> I think one of the things that, that, I mean, just sort of to jump in on it in case anybody has any overarching um, questions about it, but one of the things that really impressed me about um, this book was I had no idea when Yale went co-ed that they didn't really go co-ed. They let women onto the campus, <laughs> barely. And when your stats started to show up at the end of the book about um, how there'd been like no accommodation in terms of changing the buildings or in the financial. Hi, Raj. We're all vaccinated, Raj. Okay. Perfect. Water or wine, sir? Nope, no problem. We got both. Here, I'll just leave this here because this one was poured and nobody took it. Um, but one of the things that really surprised me was there was no accommodation in um, ladies' rooms, no accommodation in um, living quarters. There was no accommodation for sports. Um, that was my favorite character, by the way. Yeah. The Sorry. Hockey. Yes, yeah. the, she was great. I mean, um, or a person. Yeah. Um, and how it was okay with them. Okay with Yale or okay with the women? Okay with the, oh no, okay with yeah. Yale. Yeah. I mean, so I'd kind of, I mean, I know that's the crux of your book, but that's kind of the, the, the thing I came away with. Um, I'll tell you a story I, uh, about something that happened recently. So 
Um, Yale, to its credit, had a really good reunion in September of 2019, the 50th anniversary of co-education at Yale, where I invited all the first women back. And part of the reason it was such a, a really good event was some of those first women planned it, Yale didn't. Um, <laughs> but they, they invited me to um, moderate a panel of the first women talking about the first women. And, and to that point, we all got there and it was in the Yale Auditorium, which is a fancy wood paneled auditorium. And we're sitting up front at the table. It's me and five of the first women. And the chairs they gave us were chairs sized for men. So we're all up there and sitting and um, we're so low that we look like little kids at the grown-ups table. And so even just that, and one of the women called it right away, but even just that little thing of really, you're gonna give this group of women these giant men chairs. Um, and then after, uh, after one of the panels, Yale's president, Peter Salovey was there and one of the women raised their hand and said, you know, when we were there, there were almost no women faculty. How, what's the percentage of tenured women faculty today? You know, and, and, and indeed that is true. Uh, of the 407 tenured faculty in 1969, three were women. And Peter Salve, the president of Yale, who is there for the 50th anniversary of women at Yale says, I don't know what the percentage of tenured women faculty is on the faculty. I don't know, but I can see um, Marvin in the front row, Marvin was the, is the Dean of Yale College. And so Marvin can tell us. And so I said, Marvin, what's the percentage of tenured women? Marvin goes, I don't know, <laughs> but I'll try to find this out. This is a and, woman's reunion. Yes, yes. I mean, at, at least he should have been prepped by his prepper, but yeah. Mm -hmm. But but it, it spoke so much to still how little it matters that he, he wouldn't even know that number. I knew the number, it's 27%, 50 years later, it's 27%. Yeah, yeah. And, and so Marvin is, you know, digging away on his laptop, like someone has asked him, you know, how many cans of tuna is consumed at Yale either, some <laughs> insignificant number, which of course he wouldn't know. And what he says is, well, the percentage of tenure and tenure track faculty, so that's a, an inflated number, is 36%. And I, I kept my mouth shut, but I did want to just, you know, jump up and scream because it, it still has never been a priority of the administration to, to make things right. Um, and, uh, that, and that bathroom issue, um, I, uh, w when I started this research, I knew really early on I was going to have to do a lot of my own oral histories because the, the primary sources didn't exist. And so I got some training in doing interviews and I, um, UMass has a center for women in politics. So I interviewed two of the early women legislators in the Massachusetts legislature. And both of them talked about how they'd have to leave the floor and miss a vote because they had to go down three stairs and up four flights to find the bathroom. So I think that experience of not even having a bathroom and what that you know means um, is common not just at Yale but among you first women. Go to the Yale Club in New York City, and you go to um, some of the dining rooms. They do not have women's bathrooms on the floor for some of the various dining areas. Yeah. It's just, yeah. The nearest equivalent I can even think of is Hidden Figures. Yeah. Where they talk yes. about the NASA. Yes. I was just thinking of the women that had to go run across the campus in order to find a ladies' room that they were allowed to use. Mm -hmm. Do you know there are even gendered bathrooms anywhere anymore? Oh, please. We're 2021. I want there to be gendered bathrooms. Yeah, we're going to slide. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I actually heard the opposite also. Yeah. Oh, from Janet. At least in Boston. Really? Yes. yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I'm very interested what gave, what made you decide that this was a topic that you wanted to write about? You know, I'm often asked that. And so there, there's the standard answer I give. I'll give you that answer. But I'll also give you the answer I don't give. And, and, and both of them are true. So the, so the big answer or the sort of the easy answer is, I had gone back to school to get my doctorate. Uh, I was in sort of a throwaway required course on that I had to take on the history of higher education that at the time had nothing to do with my dissertation. 
And um, I thought I'll just write a history of, I'll see what happened with those first women at Yale. Cause I had been, I was eight years after them. Yeah, no you. one talked about them. I didn't know anything about, it was just like this invisible history. Um, and I read all the secondary books and none of them um, had talked to the women. They all told it from the perspective of the men. And so I was still working wow. full time at my job at the Department of Higher Education. At that point, I took a day off of work. I drove the two hours to the Yale archives thinking, surely it's these men who are writing this history and, and the material is there. And the That's Yale scary. archives, yeah. And at that point, I just was like, this is ridiculous. And it felt like this was a history I could write, you know? So I trained as a historian, but I knew Yale, but I was enough distant that it, it wasn't as, as personal. Um, I, I would say sort of the real, that the one of the, the real personal tie for me is I was the first woman editor of the Yale Daily News. Mm -hmm. And so as a 20 year old, I you know I was, I had a full page profile in the New York Times. I was in People Magazine. I was on the cover of the, um, from Baltimore, the Baltimore Sunday Magazine. So that experience of being exposed and first was one that was not comfortable for me. And so I think there was a personal curiosity in how these other women had dealt with that. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's the probably the more personal answer. Um, so all, only eight years after? Yeah. And you were the first that's not that fast, right? You, yeah. and, and, you know, I, I would have thought you just said 20. It took them 20 years to have a woman be the, you know, in an important position like that. I wouldn't have been surprised. Yeah, and my so was only eight. The once they lifted that quota limiting the number of women, the the percentage of women rose very Maybe Title quickly. Nine. Um, no, not because of Title IX, because of the activism of the women's students oh. and, and the men's students who, who supported them. So they lifted that quota after four years. My class was about 40% women. So it didn't feel like we were in the minority. And my class was really the one where for the first time the women were at the heads of the student organization. So I was the head of the Yale Daily News, the very first woman head of the Yale Political Union, which is the largest undergraduate, um, was in my class. And God bless her, the first woman head of the Yale Marching Band, which you know, if you know anything about oh the my Yale God. Marching Band, it is raunchy. And, um, <laughs> and, and she was in, in my class as well. So that's when you finally saw um, the leadership come through. In part, so for me, um, I was, I had, I was sort of groomed for that editorship, I was given the president's beat. I covered um, Bart Giamatti in his first year as president, but that's because the two news editors who had lost the election for editor in chief were women. And so it, there was a women's support network in all of those organizations that were helping. I was just in the right place at the right time. Yeah. So, uh, 81. That point that you mentioned about being surprised, that's what happened to me when I started doing this research. So even though I had gone to Yale and you know, I was a good little feminist when I was in middle school, I'd wear that 58 cents button around <laughs> about how much women earn for every dollar or care earned by men. My, my mother was um, uh, uh, in the Maryland state legislature, one of the early women legislators. But I had no idea that um, Yale had a quote on women. I was so shocked. I, I was so shocked and I, I didn't know that. And I also assumed stupidly naively that somehow letting women in had something to do with the women's movement and equality, right? And um, it didn't. <laughs> so, that probably surprised me more than anything. Yeah. Because the, the group, the best men students are going elsewhere, that's why they let women in. Right. Some yeah. systems are doing it for the men. That's disgusting. Right. I'm sorry, but that's just a violence. <laughs> and, 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 wait, Anita was next. <laughs> just, um, that was something I wanted to ask you was, because I, the one, the thing that surprised me a lot, since I went to college two years later, in my freshman year of college was 71, not later. Yeah. Um, but I was very surprised by 
the Sarah, by the, by the, you know, the sex education that, I mean, that was like, what an amazing resource and that they had and that, and that Yale was like, yeah, sure, fine, set it up. And I just thought that was a great thing. And every college should have had something like that. And they probably have. Well, and their publication. Yeah, yes, and their publication, but what a great resource. But I was wondering, like in all your research and all your talking to people, and you were talking about how you're surprised by the, by the quota, but what's a, was there anything that surprised you the most, you know, some little thing that you learned while you were interviewing all these people? Like, wow, so, uh, so oh, there was really so many so, things. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, certainly I was surprised by that Phil and Lorna who are, lovely people just I just so enjoy getting to know them as, as part of this research um, that they were able to do that and um, I, and I, but again the answer was not this is what women students needed the answer was Yale didn't want to be embarrassed by having pregnant co-eds right. walking around yeah. um, uh, and so we'll give them birth control pills um, I uh, I think on the darker side, um, one of the things I thought I needed to prepare myself for, but I didn't know what I would find was, was there any sexual harassment yeah. or sexual assault? Yeah. Um, because there wasn't any documentation of it this early on. And so I thought, and I wasn't aware of it when I was there. And um, so when that started coming out in the interviews, and then when I found the documentation deep, deep, deep in the archives of, of graduate students documenting it. That really surprised me. And yeah, yeah. And so that was one. You know, what that brought back to me, though, was an old story from my alma mater, Sarah Lawrence. Um, and the um, faculty offices in the early days of Sarah Lawrence were mostly in the basements. The, the buildings were all a combination of dormitories, classrooms, faculty offices. and the faculty offices mm. tended to be down at the lowest level, and they all had these portholes in them. And the story that we were told, apocryphal or not, was that when a woman named Constance Warren was president of the college, she was appalled at the number of romantic interactions there were between the students and faculty. Mm. And so she had these portholes put in so that she could walk the corridors and see what was going on when the students were in conference with the professors. Wow, good for her. And, you know, and today, <laughs> of course, we would call that sexual harassment, but back then it was romantic relationships. Yeah. And she was probably checking on the students just as much. As oh, absolutely. She was probably absolutely. of the sure. time. So, well, so GE, they used to have a policy where if you pulled someone into your office to talk to them, if you were speaking to a man, you could close the door. But if you were speaking to a woman, you never close the door. Oh, wow. Never. Oh, yeah. Because then you would never be accused of something that would be exactly. behind a door. Yeah. Well, that was true of teachers. The teachers could, in a way, You know, just don't play with fire. <laughs> yeah. Well, just, you know, sensitive for the female student, but also for anybody walking by. Well, the flip side of that is listening to Kate's story about being raped. I mean, yeah. I mean, that I don't remember having those discussions. I mean, I was a couple, few years younger than this but I don't remember having discussions about people being sexually harassed that later I found out were either raped or sexually harassed. I mean, it just wasn't part of the talk that we had. I don't remember discussing it. So even if some, but, but I always felt that I had some place to go if something like that happened to me and to have people not have any place to go or talk to yeah. that's horrific to me. Yeah. I got a, um, this is my first book. And so I, so I don't know what's typical of authors, but one of the wonderful things about it is I get mail, email all the time from, from people who read it. And I got an email from a guy who was Yale class of 57. Oh gosh, what does that make him? Mid eighties. And he was telling me how much the book affected him. And then he shared a story about how 
a professor had invited him out for a beer and he was really flattered that the professor was paying so much attention to him. And all of a sudden he noticed the professor's hand on his leg and he thought it was a mistake at first. And then the professor started feeling him up and he jumped up and you know just felt such shame at what he had done. And he, and he said, but I didn't have anybody to tell about it. And, mm -hmm. and so I think, you know, there were men in that situation as well. Um, and, and then it creates this really rough sort of catch 22 and that it's not a rational thing to tell someone because nothing's going to happen. You're just going to be shamed for it. So you don't tell it. Probably anyone. won't get great grades either. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's a part of your life that's ruined whether you. Yeah. Yeah, I you think know. we forget. Um, certainly, I did. Reading this, which is what I had said to you earlier, when we brought back all this stuff, I think we forgot. I forgot what it was like to live in that time. Yeah. To not have free day abortion. To not have access to birth control. To be harassed and not have a name for it. To be sexually harassed and not have a name for it. Yes. I don't know. It, it seems that somewhere that's buried in the mists of my, was buried in the mists of my memory. And reading this, I thought, yeah, that's what it was. But not it, just going to a men's school, but in general. In the society. Yeah. There's, there's a quote in there that they're, they're talking about one of the girls visiting um, the Sarah Sarah? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah um, and say, you know, like her comment was just, well, my first time wasn't that good. You know what I mean? Like they would just think, oh, it must just be me. me. You know, like, yeah. Well, yeah. like I went out with this guy and it was horrible, but it must have been my fault. You know, that, and I remember sort of having that feeling when I was that age, you know, like that must not it was my fault, but you know, that not thinking yeah. that somebody else or something. Not like knowing that. to expect better is how I felt. Yeah. I mean, I just. Mm -hmm. And it was, yeah, I mean, when I say I wasn't aware about it when I was there, so class of 81, eight years after them, um, I was recruited to Yale to play field hockey. I was actually- Yes! Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes! Which is yes! one of the reasons I could write the Laura Nisman story. Um, but uh, I, I only, I really, I hated, um, uh, this was right after Title IX had come in. And so they were treating us like we were a men's football team and they would give us <laughs> steak breakfast before <laughs> our games. And, you know, you just feel ill. And I, it was very intense and all about winning and nothing about camaraderie and, you know, all the, all the stuff that I'd love. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, a couple of years later, this lawsuit came out, Alexander versus Yale was the first law school suit that makes sexual harassment identified as a form of sex discrimination. It named five people at Yale and one of them was my field hockey coach. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I just was talking to a, another girl who was on the team with me and she's like, yeah, you didn't know that was going on. I'm like, no. Nope. Right. Yeah, a male coach. Yeah, a male coach. Yeah, because they were upping the stakes, they brought in a right. British male field hockey coach, mm -hmm. um, because and, and fired the woman coach because clearly the male coach is going to be better than the woman coach. Um, yeah, right. It's the yeah. British. Yeah, because yeah. So, um, so I was, you know, so even when it's going on, people weren't talking about mm -hmm. it much um, unless they were really close to it. Um, so you did not know about it. Well, and just from the alternate perspective, having gone to a school with the first class of men, we didn't think about that, <laughs> except as potential dates. Yeah. But we, I don't know if they had bathrooms. I don't know if they had nobody, you know, was this was a woman's school. Yeah. And where were the women? And we were running the show. So um, with that regard, that is not to excuse this, but that's sort of like the opposite of the, the spectrum. Yeah. Which is where we didn't talk about what it meant to have men there. You could have some empathy because we all want to graduate men. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
I knew you were but um, you know, a lot of things weren't talked about. Yeah, mm. a lot of things were just done, and you know, we're, the, the guys will figure it out, the girls will figure it out. You know, I was a resident assistant for two years, and one of the biggest things on my agenda was getting because we had no place to go for information about birth control or and that was in traditionally Catholic college. Oh yeah. Too. So you know I had well, of course you didn't. with all the information. <laughs> Where did you go to college? Planned Parenthood. No. Where you had to go into Porchester <laughs> and go to the Planned Parenthood there. But I mean I had this information. Maybe abortion was the goal. Yeah, but Nancy, some of that was time because you know when you and I are close to the same age, if not the same age, and I went to a women's college. And do you know who our physician was? Was the physician for the Denver Broncos. <laughs> okay. Oh, that is so funny. I went to a women's college, Colorado <laughs> Women's College, and the physician was, and there wasn't a woman in the office. Wow. Oh, no. It was just, I mean, wow. hello, how tone deaf can you be? And so some of that, I mean, yeah. I, I read this book about Yale and there's some of it that I, I mean, I grew up with a stepfather that took me to every Yale bowl game oh, as in my childhood. All, oh yeah. Army versus Navy, Yale. I mean, every Yale football game. I mean, we lived in the Norwalk area and drove to New Haven. It wasn't that big a deal, but I can really see that the, that the people with money would always have a problem with women going to the school. My stepfather nor his father would write a recommendation for me to go there. Mm -hmm. And so it was, so, it was such a male culture, even so with women there. It gave you some empathy for what Kenya Brewster was going through in, in Nazi. Hell no, but you know, <laughs> but my daughter went to Wheaton and it had the opposite problem because it was a women's college that brought in men. And it took them a long time because they still had all those traditions that were female. Yeah, yeah. The men didn't really care, right. but they had to be, you know, they had to be conversant in female in order to go there. There was no effort in this particular situation. It sounds like from the administration in any way, shape or form to kind of, they, I mean, as I said earlier, they just sort of let them attend instead of became co-ed. Yeah. What I was surprised at reading the book and knowing, I mean, I was around Yale at that time. So um, I, I wasn't dating JP, then I was dating his best friend, but he was at Yale. And so I was there like, every weekend for two years. Yeah. Um, I was surprised. You don't want to talk about that. Anyway. Um, about it, we <laughs> and then you'll come back and tell us about it. <laughs> I knew Sam Chauncey and, and Amy Clark and, yeah. and, and it, King and Brewster, the depiction of King and Brewster came as a surprise, I think, to both of us when I read some of this to JP when I, because I read the book first, um, that he was not, that he was so unconstructed. Yeah, um, because his reputation at the on the campus, as well as in the broader world, was, you know, this very enlightened guy who was navigating all of these difficult transitions towards, you know, away from the traditional culture and, and into a broader perspective for, for the university. And so reading your depiction of his actions was, to me, a real surprise. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Um, because at that time, he was, yes, as you said, you know, considered to be one very enlightened guy, right. um, which maybe Yale, you know, that's was Yale's, what we got was Yale's skin on him. You know, now when you look back, you can really look at it to see the truth of the matter. But and then you say, well, was he making economic decisions or was he making, um, was he following his own political? I mean, the economic decisions would be the opposition of- a Wouldn't you think it's all of it though, Myra? Or was he following his own predilections? 
And I don't know the answer. I think your conclusion is that he was also believed in what he was doing. Yeah, and I was surprised to hear about the deficit too, yeah. because if it was really monetarily driven. Well, any college president is, even if they have huge endowments, they're always monetarily driven to some degree. That's the nature of the job. But after, what is it, you said two or three years after the women were in that he had a $6 million deficit or maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. I mean, what was that? Um, so, yeah. 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 Bye. Um, you know, I often think of um, Yale President Kingman Brewster as an imperfect villain, you know, because he is admirable and incredibly admirable to the students at the time. I mean, Vice President, arch villain Spiro Agno right. takes him on right. and says the right. Yale board should follow him and he stands up for the Black Panthers and he um, uh, is in the right spot as far as students thought on Vietnam. Um, but this this issue of women, he is it's a blind spot. It's uh, mm -hmm. and, and my own view was if you just look how insular this guy's life was, you know, mm -hmm. goes to an all male prep school, <clears throat> goes to all male Yale, gets his law degree at Harvard when there's maybe 10% women, so he doesn't really have to deal with them as peers. He marries a woman from Vassar who drops out of college to marry him. Um, and then he appoints only guys who went to all Yale Mail to work for him. And because of how Yale is, where all the administration lives on campus, all of his neighbors are the Yale men that he supported. And his board of trustees are all Yale men. And um, it was, and I just got so much, it, it's in the documents and in the archives in what he writes and what he fails to write. Um, you know, the, he spends a lot of time, for example, on his uh, annual letter to the trust, his annual public letter, and he'll spend, you know, go through multiple drafts. And both the year before co-education and the year of co-education, he doesn't even mention that he's letting women in. It's like a nothing thing. Um, and, uh, and then sort of particularly the files of Elva Wasserman, who's the woman he appointed yeah. to lead co-education and how he just undercut her at every opportunity. So yeah, I'd like to hear more about her yeah, sometime. She's, she's yeah, just she's spectacular woman. She is. She uh, she really was, I, I think. Um, uh, so I, 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 I really, when you look at where the problem was, I, as Sam Chauncey would say, all of those alumni had daughters. And mm -hmm. once their daughters start getting mm -hmm. in, there and and if you read the angry letters from the alumni to the boards of trustees, what they're angry about is the kids from Exeter aren't getting in as mm -hmm. much as they used to. I paid all this money for my son to go to Exeter mm -hmm. and he got turned down by Yale. Um, or my daughter to go to Exeter. They're not complaining about women. They're complaining about class. Um, so so the 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 problem, the alumni donations go up when women come. Women um, help the bottom line at Yale when they come. The problem with the bottom line was Brewster wants to be at Harvard. And so he pays a lot of money for very fancy professors to try to be the, a better school than Harvard. And that's, and he really increases both the salaries and uh, percentage of it. Yeah, and you may know, I think they're cool. yeah. so that's, Go ahead. that's where the money problem comes. You know, I, that was one of the things that I was thinking about while I was reading the book um, yeah. because I mean, part of it was that we have to remember how young college students actually are. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, <clears throat> similar to your experience, I've been back in school for the last four years, yeah. uh, getting an education degree and doing a master's right now. Good but, for you. <laughs> but I went to Cornell in 1980. And I think the, uh, the gender balance was just you know, taken for granted. You know, there were many no women there. It was, I was in the engineering college, so it was a small percentage, but on campus as a whole, it was a more balanced uh, mix. But one of my friends, my good high school friend, went to Harvard. And when the Harvard guys came over and visited us at Cornell, because it was a Cornell Harvard game, he never saw that level of immaturity. Wow. From, I mean, it was just like, what is going mm -hmm. on with these people? And mm -hmm. they were just running around campus. I mean, First, I guess they could drink in New York because the drinking age was 18 right. and it wasn't in Massachusetts. Mm. But 
it was just this weird level of entitled immaturity. Mm -hmm. And I kept getting that sense of you know the class aspect and that mm -hmm. feeder, all the feeder schools are all male going into this school. And I think you referenced in your book a couple of times what Princeton was doing simultaneously, what Harvard was doing. But some of the other Ivies were co-ed for a much longer mm -hmm. for a much longer period. I think Cornell was co-ed for well, uh, Cornell is the only one that was co-ed, yeah. and, and so yeah, I would expect, yeah. yeah, I would expect that. Really, Penn, it's, Penn, um, Penn had a separate. Uh, so, in mm -hmm. my view, if the women had to apply to a separate college, right. Um, right. then it's right. yeah, a Radcliffe, right. a Pembroke at Brown, mm -hmm. and Penn had a separate <laughs> women's school. They did, yeah, yeah, absolutely, and you know, and they. Um, there were huge debates on the board of trustees because whether even that undermined the college. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think you may have been also experiencing at Cornell that longer history mm -hmm. of since 18, mid 18, 1870-ish right. yeah. when, when women were allowed there. Cornell said. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, that. Well, I mean, I think part of it was just what you also pointed out as far as the theater schools. Yeah. <laughs> what was the direct route, route in? So if you, Went to Andover, if you went to Andover or Choate or whatever, you were definitely going to one of these schools, uh, one way or the other. Whereas, uh, you know, if you're coming out of the school in Rockford or Smalls in New York, Cornell was more likely than, than Harvard. Or, and the Wappinger Falls School, if I pronounce that right, would have been co ed, whereas Andover and Exeter were all male, so they didn't have any experience in, with women as, as academic peers. The other thing that I found in, in your book that I really appreciated when I started reading, I grew up in Connecticut. I grew up in the middle of Connecticut, the geographical middle of Connecticut. Yeah. And I went to Central Connecticut State. I graduated in 1968, just prior to all this. And I had no idea to all of us in growing up in that area. Yale was in Connecticut. Yeah, we know it's there, but it was no big deal, except that it had a big name. It didn't have much of an impact on any of us. And I mean, we were co-ed, there was no question. Actually, the school started as a teacher's college. So there were probably a lot more women than there were men initially. I was the first liberal arts class to graduate. And it was, you know, I'm, I'm reading your book, I'm thinking, get out. <laughs> such a wonderful place, get out, you know, what are they talking about? But then I went from there to really admiring the women whom you interviewed, because I thought these women, they were, you know, they were kids basically, mm -hmm. but they had a mission. They had a sense of who they are. And I appreciated the qualities that were looked for in the women that they brought in. Yeah. And I like that you, you pointed that out. Um, and then I thought further along that the people who tend to gravitate to the top of the social political round in our country are these people. And I'm going, well, no wonder we've had problems. <laughs> 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 it really is a totally different way of being. Yeah especially the people who now are in their you know, 80s, 90s. Um, and I, I'm willing to bet that a lot of younger folks too, the men who went to Yale, still have that entitlement thing going on. A lot and, of it depends on where they come from, I think, though. Yeah, oh, I'm sure. But I'm just saying, in general, there was you know this, this appreciation for what you brought out and the way it helped me think in much bigger terms in terms of our country and the social you know feelings of the country yeah it was it was just very very interesting well thank so you so i thank you for that <laughs> Because the first thing, thinking, oh, these people, what do they know? <laughs> to, your, to your point, weren't most of the presidents from the Ivies, were they from like, mostly from Yale? Yale, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, Yale, so Yale a, field, a, a lot, lot of them. Of them. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what I was thinking. Well, Here Yale Law people. for the Clintons, but yeah. he started out somewhere yeah. else. I think. Yeah, but to your sure. point, like, I was surprised that Yale was so sort of anti-intellectual. You know, like, oh, yeah. like oh, it's, because I, I realized yeah. as I read it, oh, it's a factory. I get it now. It's like, it's not a 
bastion of higher learning. It's a factory for turning out GW leaders. Yeah, exactly. you know, like, that's, that's, exactly like, that's exactly what I chose for. And other people, some, yeah. some good, some yeah. not so good. Mm -hmm. Still. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm at, I'm at what? disadvantage. <laughs> but you can tell us about your Yale experience. I mean, so I'm, I'm certainly it was any intellectual skill by the time I got there. If you did well, you like I had a friend who was super smart, but he would wait to study till midnight when nobody knew who was he was studying because it wasn't <laughs> cool to study. It was okay to be naturally smart. You couldn't help yourself. It's like if you had blonde hair or, or whatever, but to actually mm -hmm. work hard um, was, yeah, that. That did well, not reflect well on the women. <laughs> well, there, there, as in jocks and the animals. Yeah. <laughs> and then there were the, the brains. Yeah. <clears throat> a little more class, a little more subtle. What was your major? Uh, I majored, I ended up majoring in Latin. Because I, I wonder if it's different for different colleges within the university. I mean, mm -hmm. for the humanities versus mm -hmm. the sciences and so forth, because I can't imagine being a chemistry major and not being cool to study. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, right. That's true. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm sensitive to everything you have to say, have to say about Keenan Brewster. I mean, I adore him. I didn't know him personally. I thought he was the coolest guy. Yeah. And, and here I am, a kid from nowhere. <laughs> A metaphor for America generally. I thought I came to him as an immigrant. They asked me to come and sit by the fire a lot. So I owe it everything. I owe it everything. Um, but I don't want to defend it or King Brewster uh, because A, I haven't read the book and I don't know the facts. I do know that he hired when he was appointed president after um, who preceded. Griswold. Griswold. Yeah. <clears throat> and he was a significant figure person. He hired guys like um, Chauncey was young. Mm -hmm. Wilkinson was young. Yeah. Uh, Clark was young. They were in the early 30s. Embersix was young. He was a kid. But didn't you say so, before that you were the youngest? You, you were the last class yes, without women? My graduation year was the last class in which there were four years of men only. So in September of my graduation in May is when the women first came. So I never saw any. In a way, I'm glad I got away in time. <laughs> God knows what I, you know, what, I, what I would have done. I mean, young men are, are nuts. You know? It comes to the <laughs> <laughs> So, um, but I had a, I had a, a different question. Um, I was curious about Hannah Gray. Yeah. Who you may want to introduce. I don't know if you were going to talk about her in the book. Mm, probably not much. Yeah. Um, she was provost. I mean, I, yeah, I know who she was. She yeah. was appointed provost around that time. Yeah. And then she was appointed when he left to go what is his name, Jim? British called? ambassador. Yeah. Yes. Uh, he, she was appointed acting president in his place. And you mentioned him. Don't you want to and I thought this is fabulous. <laughs> um, yeah. Lady president of Yale. This is a terrific thing. And she did it. Do you know why? Um, she went to Chicago instead. Which was yeah, I mean, I, I got there. yeah, I, I mean, I. I interviewed one of the Yale trustees who was on the search committee that decided not to offer the job to her. Really? Um, yeah. But that, that yeah. confirms to me the incredible pressure that the alumni, the rich alumni, must have had on Brewster, on the corporation, uh, that it, I don't think Brewster could have helped but be a little you know, super cautious about getting in. And it all happened rather quickly. So they just leave it down the there. Bathrooms. Uh, you know, it takes it takes a while to rebuild one of those old colleges, and 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 you the right. I don't know. But I don't want to get into this. But I, I think the the. Yeah. The, the only point that I was making is that if you're planning on admitting a different gender, you prepare for that. 
And one of the, the points that I found interesting in the book is that they did no prep. They just opened the doors and let them walk in. Right. So, but I, I don't have that answer. I was just astonished to hear that there was pressure to, because they were losing men to co-ed schools or to, you know, gender blended schools. And so in order to, to not lose the men anymore, they let the women in, not because they wanted women. They just sort of went in order to keep the caliber of men, they let the women come. That's a little different than saying, oh, we really need to balance this out here, folks. Let's invite some women. Let's do, you know. So there wasn't any real welcoming committee at the door, it seems. You know, the thing that really surprised me while I was reading the book, uh, you know, right from the beginning, when the women were selected and admitted, was the, I know the numbers were still small, but the number of African-American women who were admitted. Uh, and I know you placed a, a number of them in central positions in your book. But um, I guess I don't have enough background of what was going on in the 60s, but it seems surprising to me that a school that was so closed off in so many different ways did open itself to so many African-American women. So, so you know, again, uh, and this is Booster and Yale were real right. leaders at the time in bringing in African American students. So, the first uh, and and the male African American. So, so Yale for many 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 years had what was called the class black. They let in one black student, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, no pressure there, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> and then it must have been a miserable, mm -hmm. miserable. Um, I, I did a, a, a different paper on um, Pembroke, which was the women's college at Brown, and they would let in one black woman a year, and they wouldn't give her a roommate. All the white women <gasps> had a roommate oh and a God. black woman. And I just, oh you know, as the mother of a daughter, it just yeah, broke my right. heart thinking yeah. of what that was like. But anyway, Yale starts letting in lets in the first big class, 14 students, and those African American students, the male students who came in were sharp and they worked hard and to Brewster's credit, he listened to them. And so um, Yale uh, hires these students to go back to their high schools and recruit more students. And, and they are really pushing Yale to let in um, equal numbers of, of women students as, as well. The Yale's focus is on African-Americans. It didn't even count how many Asian American or Latinx students were there. I'm the first one who figured that out. Um, so the, the focus really was on African American students, but you know, Shirley and, and um, Connie and Vera Wells will in, in some ways, uh, or all of the African American women I talked to, one will say I, they had a home there in the Afram house. And so in some ways they had an us that those white women didn't have. To some extent. That, yeah. that really fascinated me is yeah. the and and it's I doubt it was intentional. I would think but scattering the women, they thought, oh well, everybody will have a taste of some women in their college. Yeah. And I don't think that anybody except maybe Elga thought about the lack of camaraderie that, that would present to the women. Yeah by being scattered throughout the institutions. Such yeah, so. I mean, Brewster initially um, did not want to scatter the women because he thought it would be seen as scandalous. So back to the mm -hmm. institution's <laughs> reputation. Yeah. You know, he wanted all the women in their own residential college, sure. sort of like a mini Radcliffe. And, and the men, male students revolted against that. Some because I want my piece of the action. I want the girls living in my dorm and some because it they felt like that would give a lower status to the women to be cordoned off like that um but the 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 end result was there was a very difficult tough meeting booster had with the students and they just beat him up over it and he just gave in and said sure we'll start them all over. i think you have to remember too that what was going on at yale was a, a microcosm in, in sense of what was going on everywhere in yeah. society at that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I looked at it and as I said to you, I thought, 
wow, you know, I remember those days. What happened to all that? <laughs> what happened to all that fire in the belly? Mm -hmm. um, what, you know, I mean, what happened to those women? I was one of those women. Yeah. You still are. You still are. <laughs> I was going to say, there's nothing that's tamed you, Nancy. <laughs> but I mean, they really made a difference. I remember the African-American female students, because we had one African-American male student in the class. Um, they had a uh, student, they had their own student union. Very much like the, you know, the African American house at Yale. Yeah. They had their own group. That didn't mean they didn't hang with us. You know, we lived on the same hall. Now I'm talking all women here. Yeah. But um, but there definitely was a separation. Yeah. You know, they and I mean I've kept in touch with a number of these women, um, but there was definitely a separation there. Um to keep their blackness yeah. you know to, to keep that that was part of it so um those were things that were going on everywhere yeah mm -hmm. yeah i just got a letter the other day from a woman at the university of illinois which had been co-ed since 1870 saying it wasn't just at yale we didn't know where to get an abortion we had men hitting on us in ways that were not comfortable mm -hmm. so yeah i yeah. think you're and you're one right of on. the girls on my on my hall got an abortion um, they were afraid to, the other girls in the hall were afraid to tell me yeah. because I was like the house mother <laughs> and they didn't want to upset me. Yeah. Yes. I, I think it's interesting to know and to forget that abortion was legal in New York State. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Quite a few years before it was legal. Yeah, yeah. you talk about Connecticut's oh, yeah. Connecticut's yeah, approach to some of this stuff. Seventy-one yeah. in Connecticut. Yeah. Uh, no, no, it well, seven, Connecticut. It's not until uh, it, it, the the lawsuit goes on and on and on until it, it really doesn't come but in until Roe. But um, in January of seventy-three, New York passes the first. Um, law nationally where you don't have to be a resident. So Hawaii was ahead of New York, but you had to be a resident. But um, I'm sorry, I should know this off the top of my head. It I want to say 73? it's uh, Roe versus 73. Wade. Yeah, Roe versus Wade is January 73. I want to say New York is um, fall 71. It's mm -hmm. definitely not 1970. Okay, 71. Um, yeah. But still, then, if you're in Connecticut, you got to find someone to drive you to New York mm -hmm. and you still find a place mm -hmm. to stay. And yeah, it, it, it's not so easy. Um, Dippy, mm -hmm. I do want to push back a little on this sort of what I think is a myth about the reason these schools may have been reluctant on putting women in leadership <laughs> roles or accepting women is because the alumni would get mad at them. Because the the stats just don't show that. So Yale gets one of its biggest gifts, you know, from John Hay Whitney as part of going co-ed. Mm. Alumni contributions go up. I mean, you can always find some old alum who's going to grouse about there being women there, mm -hmm. but it doesn't show up on the bottom line. The alumni do not stop giving money um, and it, it just doesn't happen. With, with Hannah Gray, so I, when I was a freshman at Yale, Hannah Gray was the acting president, but six months into her presidency, she finds out, and she was exactly, she was more qualified than Kingman Brewster mm -hmm. had been. She mm -hmm. had been the provost, the number two position, she was an acting president, and um, the board of trustees decided they wanted this guy who was the um, dean at Harvard, and so they offered it to him because they felt like he would be a better leader. So you tell me yeah. what that's about. Oh, I was yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, what's, what was his name? Roscoff, something like that. Uh, anyway, and then when she found out she'd been, she wasn't the first pick, she'd been wooed by University of Chicago and then said yes to being their president. So she's the first woman president, I don't know what you would call them, of an elite private school. Right. 
but not Yale. It's and then Yale. and then Yale picks Bart Giamatti instead, who ends up being a great president. His sole qualification was he had been the master of Styles College, so a very lowly, lowly, lowly <laughs> administrative words, position at Yale. Zero. Right, zero. Yeah, zero. Um, he, I, I, he was a great president. He did end up being a great president, but he had no qualifications. There's no way he should have been chosen over Hannah Gray. Yeah. 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 You keep talking about the, the or, or I'm trying to understand if I read it correctly. I, yeah. When I was reading it, I felt like Brewster thought the administration didn't want this, and he made these assumptions that they didn't want it, and so he was doing this, I can't because, you know, the, the the alumni, not the administration, the alumni will revolt, the alumni will stop mm -hmm. giving the alumni. But that wasn't actually true, right? That was his assumption that that was going to happen. I he was, was, was there actually something that made him think that other than what, what how right? dare they, you know, they, they couldn't possibly support something like that. I think it became a nice excuse, mm -hmm. but, you know, so Sam Chauncey was probably closer to Brewster than any other mm -hmm. human on the planet. And, and luckily I knew Sam from when I had been an undergraduate and so, and interviewed him multiple times. And, you know, what he said was, you know, where there were a couple things that Brewster really cared about. And one of them was an all male Yale. And, mm -hmm. um, and so the, I, I think possibly he assumed the alumni would oppose, but they, they never did. They never asked him like this whole thing that uh, Yale would not reduce the number of male undergraduates. Mm -hmm. That's not something the alumni asked him to do. That's something he came out and promised to them without them asking. And then he had, then he felt he had to stick to that. I think you explain it very well when you talked about the insularity of the subject. Yeah. Yeah. And his yeah. experiences. You know, yeah. We all, today we all talk, to, talk about our lived experiences and yeah. we have to understand the narrowness of his lived experiences. Yeah. Wait, 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 Rich was talking? No, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say I was fascinated by Edgar Watson. Mm -hmm. um, and just, I, I found myself cheering on her persistence and stick to itiveness. And there was a sentence that really struck me. Um, they were talking about um, the point when. Alec got involved, uh, the young man got involved. Oh, involved. Alec Haverstick, yeah. And th there was a sentence there that you used that said, how assertive can one be without losing their credibility? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was almost sort of like a critique of Elga that she was being too assertive and losing credibility. Uh, and then he seemed to be the guy that sort of took the ball and ran with it and was sort of, um, much more acceptable than yeah he was one of them yeah. I think, but, yeah but I think there was also because it was really personal to me because I've had a history of challenging various institutions and people that in growing up in the various places I've been and um, I've had that same sort of attack uh, at me mm -hmm. um, and so I found myself cheering her on and, and I was so disappointed at the end because you were talking about the, the glowing accomplishments of all these women um, that had graduated from Yale, you know, that first group. And then you got to Elga, and it was like she never got the position that she had deserved and earned. Um, but her her persistence was, well, I'm going to go to law school and I'll become a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I was like, <laughs> So I really appreciate it. And I love this. I love the book. I love the story, but um, she really fascinates me. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. And and like you, I was like, good for her. Yeah. We're going to law school. Uh, yeah, I just yeah. felt like when I first read the first part of that paragraph, and it was like, you know, she didn't get this. Like, you know, what what happened to her? You know, and as you start to keep reading, you're like, oh wow, she just turned it around. Yeah, and her. because Harry, her husband, was tenured at Yale she wasn't going to leave New Haven. So she had offers, I believe, at other schools, but she had to figure out what, what do you do in a one-company town like yeah. New Haven, where Yale's a major employer, and 
and you know to go to Yale Law School as a whatever she was by that point, late forties, early fifties, yeah. was really something. Yeah. You know, one of the uh, things that we we talked about alumni, we talked about students and um, the administration, but you mentioned the faculty periodically throughout the book in different cases. But what was was there any kind of general? view on what the faculty response was to going to OLEC? Because I assume some of the faculty came from colleges that were OLEC themselves. Um, or were they just universally living in their own, you know, in their own world with their classes and students and research? Um, so, the, I mean, so the faculty does take a, um, uh, a unanimous save for one vote, vote in favor of co-education. Um, Many at by that point, um, Yale, because Brewster is trying to be a, a peer with Harvard, is no longer just hiring people who went to Yale. So it had had sort of a substandard faculty because it would never go beyond <laughs> Yale. Because why would you? <laughs> <laughs> but it starts realizing that there's some really sharp people uh, graduating from the University of Michigan and the University of Ohio. And those people come to Yale and they start changing the faculty saying, oh my God. Yeah, I, I, I guess I was thinking about just like in the individual classroom behavior. I mean, I was mm -hmm. looking at some of the things I highlighted, and mm -hmm. you know, there are sections where it was the women when they spoke in class, mm -hmm. it was like, you know, like, like I think you had a line in there saying it was like during the furniture speech. Yes. Yeah. 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 And and some of that in the classroom it has nothing to do with the alumni, it has nothing to do with administration, it has to do with the professor who's yeah. running the class. And I was wondering if um, if there was any cultural change. So, so I got the point about the one guy who yeah. stayed and was uh, uh, thorn in everybody's side for yeah. a while. But on the whole, what was the culture like? Because they, they were also making a transition. Uh, I mean, well, the, so some of the women, um, almost all of the women had a story of at least one male faculty member who was a real mentor and hero to them. Okay. You know, so like that story of Kit McClure and the guy letting her experiment on those African toads and right. you know and and they all have a story of at least one male professor who hit on them who um you know would tell them you know there was a famous one who a music teacher who put yeah. porn yeah. on the you know yeah. I mean, oh, so yeah. so you, so it was varied <clears throat> and they did what they wanted um and so you either lucked out and got a good professor or you didn't I, I don't know does that answer yeah, yeah it does i mean i'm sure word got around yeah, yeah exactly so people say you know go to this professor's class and not that one but yeah but that first class was all the, the yeah. canary in the coal mine boiled yeah, yeah. yeah. um in, just moving away from yale for a minute i want to talk about the construction of the book which i thought was brilliant because by picking individual people and involving that us in their lives that's what made it so incredibly readable. Yeah. I mean, you know, it seems looking at it now, it seems like, well, of course you did that, but there were a lot of ways you could have written this history. But by choosing these women and focusing on these women and focusing on individuals like Elder, you know, and and King and Brewster and their backgrounds and where they came from, um, it really draws you in. I have to say this when I saw this book. And I loved it. I also was tired. <laughs> <laughs> it's like bleh. You know what I mean? Compared to, I'm, I mean, I'm just being honest. Compared to the story between the covers, yeah. I thought, you know, it needs some kind of splashy thing on there. Um, but that is, you know, the way I felt about it. I felt that, wow, this was really, you know, I would not probably not have picked it up just based maybe on the title. I would have picked it up with a recommendation when I read it because we were waiting for this. Yeah, Nancy, I have to totally disagree with you. Really? Yes, because I immediately thought, oh my God, it's, as, as I was reading it, realizing how it was going, I thought, it's like Mars needs women. It's <laughs> like, you know, the, only, the only reason they brought them in there was because their, their boys wanted women. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now, 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 now
totally disagree. I saw it um, at a public library near my school. Um, it was like sitting on the stage, and I saw the title. I was like, I need to read that book. <laughs> 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 like, okay, that. well, I'm in the minority. Now, where are you in school? I'm going to my junior year um, next week, actually. Where? Uh, University of South Carolina. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah, it was, as you all were talking about, um, like, Thank you, experiences. Well, I'm thinking I read this book with a very different perspective. Like yeah. Being a college student now, I was just very impressed by um, all these young women who are like my age or a year younger, or two years younger, who like had all these terrible experiences at college and like continued and graduated um, and like pushed through all this like discrimination. I think one of the huge things that stuck out to me was um, when you mentioned that there was no term for sexual harassment. Yeah. yeah. That like didn't ever occur to me that there was never a term for that. Yeah. Um because like you know my freshman year we had to go we had to do like online sexual harassment training and stuff. Yeah. And like of course it's very much still an issue on college campuses. And my school last last semester there was a lot of um, talk that a lot of people <laughs> a particular professor fired because he claimed to use their Several were, you, were you surprised by the prohibitions of, of the times, the, the, the yeah, limits I mean, put on women? I mean, I mean, were you aware of that? Were you surprised by to, it? To some extent, I was aware. Um, I read a book um, my freshman year of high school about Title IX and how that changed a lot of things. So I was aware of a lot of that thing. Um, that kind of thing when I did a project um, on the women's movement of like the 60s and 70s school so I was aware of a lot of it but um like that I was not aware that there was like it was illegal to get an abortion in Connecticut at the time yeah. um and just <laughs> there was no term for sexual harassment like yeah. really threw me for a loop and I was like oh my god what how well well what's what's <laughs> you you strange is always the girl's yeah. fault <laughs> what's even on. what's yeah. even stranger is to realize i mean now i didn't get i graduated high school in 72 so i'm a little younger than this group but in the middle of all of this the vietnam war is raging mm. and an entire student body i mean everywhere i went and i you know in a lot of different places most people my age at that time were very much against the war because our family members and friends were coming home in body bags. So underneath all of this is this feeling that somehow people in authority could not, it was the first time in my life I realized I couldn't trust them really. They were families. Yeah. And that they had my life in their hands. And so then you look at this and you go to a campus where you have to be that kind of a pioneer when the society hasn't really caught up. Mm. You know, they have they haven't, but it's these people that made that possible. Yeah. You know, the fact that, and there's other battles now, of course, but. Yeah, it's interesting to hear that that was your like realization of like administration doesn't necessarily have your best interest at heart. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like every generation has their own. Like, I would say for me, it's been like a whole Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. um, that was happening while I was in high school. And I was like, oh. That's kind of bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that shouldn't be happening. <laughs> um, but like nobody's doing anything to stop it. And like, right. That was. Yeah. And that I'll bet. Depressing for a lot of people my age right. because yeah. you would think that would not even exist by now. You know, yeah. considering <laughs> what was going on in 1969 right. in, in the early 70s, it's just mind boggling that, that yeah. there is still so much of that. It's definitely depressing. Like reading this book, I some of the things that I heard, I was like, oh yeah, I've experienced that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like, mm, that shouldn't still be happening in 2020. Right. Exactly. Like um, I'm an engineering student. So mm -hmm. <laughs> you were talking about um there's significantly fewer women. Like I took a physics class um two semesters ago and the class was probably about 20 and it was myself and one other woman. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like every time I talked, every single head turned and was like, oh, he speaks. <laughs> 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 yeah. Use that voice. That's all I can say. Use yeah. that voice. Because yeah. especially in a field like physics or, in, in, or engineering. Or and you're in South Carolina? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. And there's that. Yeah. Use, use that voice. Yeah. Um, another thing that I 
those students. The sexual education to be going on at that time anywhere, surprisingly, because I think that at a lot of high schools in the South, they still don't teach these things. And I've heard from peers who went to school in South Carolina, North Carolina, or Georgia that they still teach abstinence first health classes and they don't talk about birth control or mm. contraception in any way. And like, that's not what I experienced going to high school in Danbury because yeah. people were like, well, we don't want to fight your high school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is not what really my peers experienced in the South. Well. So it's like definitely still. Oh, very much so. Yeah. And the farther south you go, often the worse it is. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to say, follow up on something Nancy said about construction. One of the things I really liked about your book was you didn't always finish a story. Like another chapter started with something else, or another part of the chapter started with something else. And you're like, well, what happened? And then you got it like 10 pages later. later, later. Yeah. yeah. So I really like that part of it because it wasn't like this. Okay, we learned about Twister and we learned about Kate and we learned about you know, right. Um, it was a, a really nice mix. Of, of, it was kind of an ongoing yeah type yeah of experience for everybody, and if you wrote the book in an ongoing yeah. type yeah of experience, yeah, which no, is so strong. I think it was well written and well put mm-hmm. together yeah, in that sense. Yeah, was, uh, uh, you know, love the, oh, sorry, go ahead. no, go ahead. I was just going to say, since I'm looking at Isabel Wilkerson's book with the, the format mm-hmm. you had was a lot like her first book, The Warmth of Other, mm-hmm. um, yeah. you know, it was a similar uh, focus on the individuals and going through a uh, period of time. So. Well, and it makes it a sort of novelistic in a way. I mean, it, mm-hmm. it makes it read mm-hmm. that, you know, more uh, comfortably yeah. that way than, than reading just a, a book about a history of something. I wanted people to read it. Yeah, <laughs> well, we did. Has it been selling? What? Has it been selling? They, it's it's doing well. I mean that they brought it out in paperback. So yeah, that's a, you know that's a good. That's story. a huge. That's a huge one, particularly now in the book trade. The other thing is it got Connecticut Book of the Year for nonfiction last year. So that's that's huge. I mean that's a very big deal. Give it. There are a few people I want to give it to. One is my daughter, who's an architect. And she is in a male-dominated field. Yeah, she, like you'll be. <laughs> she went to Lehigh University. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. which was an all-male school. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, she's going to write that. And tomorrow, my college roommate from Manhattanville is coming for one of her, like, annual, biannual visits. And uh, she happens, she lives on the other side of the state. Um, and she works for Yale. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. She works in one of the offices and, mm-hmm. and she's administrative something or another. Yeah. It's terrible that I don't know. But I'm going to find out. Yeah. And I'm going to get the yeah. scoops yeah. really good. Tomorrow, I'm going to get she went to Yale Architecture School, but I need to do oh. it. Also, she wanted to come to you. Yeah. <laughs> she's pregnant. She's getting the one in the house. Yeah. Because Robert Stern was the mm-hmm. dean of the School mm-hmm. of Architecture there. Mm-hmm. I, I do. My daughter works for her. A little more context at the time. As well, I was thinking about what you were saying, what you're surprised that hasn't changed and, and what has. I mean, at this time, I was applying for my first real job, and um, Time Life, as it was then known, um, had a position for management trainee. And my then boyfriend, who was a Yale man, um, which we still know. Um, <laughs> Um, Which we're going to hear about later. And I, who had graduated the year before him from Sarah Lawrence, was applying, wanted to apply for this job. And I was told I could not apply for the management trainee job because those were only open to men. And I could apply for a research assistant job at Time Life, which paid half of what the management yeah. trainee job paid. Yeah. And that was towards the end of 1969. And how did you feel about that at the time? I was pissed as hell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because, was you know, curious. sometimes we no. just, some women just said, no, no, no I was like curious. Something. But I, but what I ended up doing was going to work for Random House um, in their children's book department, not making much more than the research assistant at Time Life would have made. But at least I hadn't been told I couldn't apply for some job there. Yeah. 
And and ultimately, I got my revenge because I went publishing and went into the investment business. And, you know, <laughs> I, I wish it was another male and still is another male dominated mm -hmm. field. So now I'm involved with a thing called Girls Who Invest, which is aimed at getting more women into the asset management business. Um, and that's that's the, the part of me that went to the consciousness raising groups in, in, the, in the 1970s is still trying to activate that in different ways. Okay. Consciousness raising groups. It it was very sad to me that the that the women who tried to get the women together it just didn't work. Yeah. The women were not My used to meeting like with other women. Yeah. yeah. So there was no there was no feeling of female solidarity or or that or that female companionship was valuable. I mean, to some of the women it was. You know, they they really wanted to have to talk to other girls. But as a as a unit, you know, as a yeah, and that they said, oh, my boyfriend doesn't want me to go to the gym. Anymore. Well, in society as a whole, I think from that consciousness raising era, we have, I hope, I feel, come to recognize the value of female friendships. Mm -hmm. I don't think female friendships had a value. I don't think I realized it as much as, you know, I went to nothing. I went to a girls boarding school and a women's college, so I had nothing but girls around me most of the time. But I I mean, I, I think one of the one of the moments in this book that reminds me of what you're talking about is when Wasserman Wasserman, right? She left, and the woman came in with the teacup oh and the gloves yeah. to replace her. Yeah. I yeah. thought, and the white gloves. That says it all. Yeah. I mean, how little you change as you make all of this forward movement, mm -hmm. and then there's this back step of, oh my God, yeah, who is this woman? Yeah. One of the great ironies I found as I was reading it, I was also, I had the news on TV and um, people from, there was a, I don't even know what the total story was, but they had women from New Haven, from the community talking about how little women earn mm -hmm. compared to men. And as I'm reading that, I'm reading here, mm -hmm about um, women, what, 74 cents on the dollar compared to yeah, men. Yeah, and, I, I and then there was dollars. Gina Oriyama saying, you know, no matter how good our girl, our women are, when they play basketball, their facility for the championship games are less than mm -hmm. the male. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm reading this and I'm thinking, wait a minute, we have not come as far Mm -hmm. And we would like to think we have. Yeah. And that's UConn women. They're top of their game. Exactly. And they're yeah. still not doing I mean, Exactly. And they win more than the boys do. Some, sometimes <laughs> there are some things that, you know, we, that have changed. It seemed as though, you know, as typical, I think, in society as a whole, something always led us away from the feminist movement. Mm -hmm. Something else came, came up. up. Sometimes it's just children. Yeah. Yeah. And leave the women, they'll still be there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. it's what you mentioned about the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. all, somehow the whole woman's issue got pushed to the side yeah. because now we had, you know, all of the Vietnam War protests, yeah. which was certainly important. But as it, you, you said it very well, you know, women will always be there. Right. And we'll, we'll, get, so to them we'll get to them. Yeah. 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 But, yeah. You know, but I don't get the sense in reading this about this time period, because we're talking really about gender inequality, that all of the social issues of the Vietnam War and Ohio and all of those things that were going on really touched this group the way it would have touched people that didn't have a way out of having to go. Mm. I mean, they were in college, they were protected, they had their daddies, they had their, 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 mm. they had, they were an insulated group. I don't hear the Vietnam War as a touching them the same way. Yeah, yeah, that may be the way I wrote that changed it. The yeah, they're that's all right. Yeah, but the law, I know my boyfriend was a three and they stopped it right before they, right before he would have been eligible to go. Yeah. The whole thing with Vietnam, I'm sorry. with the Black Panthers, all of those things, those those are very real in this state at that time. Yeah, there's no question. But I think that one of the values of the way you did the book is that it pointed that out. How easy it is to you know have to pay attention to other things because this is tough. I mean, this whole you know 
sexism thing is a top issue. Yeah. My, wait, Myra is next and then you, Raj. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that I think that it did actually affect this group. And yeah. that JP and I went to a um, Yale Class of 68 50th reunion and they did a seminar um, on the Vietnam War and how it had affected the lives of various people who had graduated oh. from that class of 68. And then they kind of went around the room, they just opened it up to anybody who wanted to speak. And whether people's lives were affected by having gone to war and being disillusioned or having gone to war and come back heroes or having avoided the draft and gone to Canada or there were so many stories. It seemed to me like almost every person in that room had in fact been affected. By the war personally. Wow. Wow. Um, it is very moving actually to, to listen to stories from, from every political angle you mm -hmm. can imagine. Except well, George, who certainly avoided George Rush. <laughs> yeah, I, who's surprised? <laughs> Raj, what were you yeah, going to say? No, I was just going to point out the example you have in the book about Janet Yellen, yeah. who was speaking yeah. through that period, and she also got sidelined uh, by the entire president. <laughs> the former guy yes, yeah. the former but, guy <laughs> but um on the other hand i i personally saw a lot of change from being a student in 1980 and going and applying for a job at uh, one of the libraries the librarian who was really perplexed about whether or not a you know 17 year old male student <coughs> from india was going to take uh Direction from her. She said, I know your culture has this, you know, this mm. hang oh, up wow. there, and I'm just, you know, like, oh. holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> I'm just trying to get it. And you know, that was that was in 1980s. And yeah. um, and I watched, you know, I spent a long time at IBM and I watched the culture transform in IBM to the point when I got stuck, and I think part of it was uh, a minority issue. And I went to one of my old bosses who was, you know, she was the fiercest woman I've ever met. And said, you know, I think I need a mentor. And she was my mentor, put me in the executive ranks. And she and a whole group of people are the reason why Jane Rosetti became CEO of IBM. So I, I think those lessons that you described in the book were taken to heart in many different places. So, so I know my sister is a, um, she's got a PhD in, Human engineering and works at Facebook, and she's another stick at it. So <laughs> usually, uh, but, you know, I, I think there has been a lot of progress as well. It's not like yeah. you know, it's not like everything that we saw in the '60s okay. and '70s yeah. is still happening. Yeah. Right. It just hasn't happened as fast. Maybe yeah. It's not as not yeah. 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 I just want to circle back to Vietnam one more time, and and really to uh, the point you were making, Jan, which is. Um, I mean, I had a number of women say to me, you know, guys would say to me, why are you worried about women's things? Guys, men are getting killed in Vietnam. Mm. You know, it's it's worse for us. Whatever is happening to you, it's worse for us. And so, you know, Vietnam is more important. And then within uh, with the black students and the black women, there was a lot of pressure to show unity and a feeling that the black men had been emasculated by male society. And so the women needed to take a back seat. So even someone as strong as Shirley, you know, would be in the meetings with Brewster, she wouldn't really talk because the men should talk. Um, and so I think there were those other issues that were being presented as more important than, than the women. Uh, and one of the reasons I didn't, I felt like everyone who writes about the late 60s writes about Vietnam and the Black Power Movement, but there was this other thing going on with women, and that's what Got I'm thinking it. about. And I thought that was really the strength of your book. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because it said this was important it remains important today yeah and even we though well you know i was oblivious to what was going on at yale but the fact is this was happening there were very strong women and everything else was going on was like the hum in the background but this was real too yeah yeah it's not pride right i mean why do people treat it like pride <laughs> Like if you, <laughs> I give you your oh, yes. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah.
It's nine o'clock, so we're gonna have one more question. That's wow, that went fast. I know. <laughs> but I'm I'm cognizant of the fact that we start at 7 30 and we do end at nine because people have to get up and go to work, but also you're driving home and, and all of those things. But I just want to make sure that any oh do you have anything further? Because your your questions were so good. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really have a question. I just I thought it was I think one of the other things that really the list that you presented in the first chapter of all of the other colleges that were not co-ed at the time. Yeah. Um, because two of the colleges on that list were the two colleges that my best friends go to. And I like am so excited to like share this book with them and be like, hey look, your colleges weren't co-ed. <laughs> 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 but I don't know, it was just such an exhaustive list. I was very surprised that like it wasn't just the IVs. Like right. I kind of yeah. expected the IVs to have that whole like men's club attitude, but the 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 list of all the other yeah, schools we forgot that and places that were like that too. Yeah. Um, that was a shock. Yeah. No, it's really the publics and the um historically black colleges that are the leaders in co-education, the ones that are seen as lower down the hierarchy are the right. ones that are the leaders here. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's unfortunate because I feel like having those female perspectives and those um, minority perspectives for a longer period of time, it really enhanced the educational value, but they're just viewed like, I mean, I go to a state school, so I, you know, there's, you say like, oh, I go to, you know, whatever state school, it, it's not the same as saying, oh, I go to Harvard. Yeah. <laughs> it's not viewed the same way, which is, I think, really unfortunate. Yeah. yeah. That's the prestige. Yeah. Yeah. Along yeah. I just, I, I love Elga Wasserman too, but who did she look to? Who were her comrades for advice? She would meet with the woman who was helping run co education at Princeton mm -hmm. and um, Polly Bunting at Harvard. Mm -hmm and never thought to talk to Yukon, who had been co ed <laughs> for a hundred yeah, years, yeah. Yeah. about because it was lower down the hierarchy. Yeah. She could have learned a lot from Yukon. <laughs> thank you all for coming. It's yeah. been thank so you. wonderful. And thank you for making the trip for us. It was so great. It was so great. Um, yeah. yeah, this is actually our first live book group. I think since the shutdown also, I mean, we decided to meet because basically um, I know and can, can control the size of the people at our book groups. This is history and next week is the general. And so when you assert that you're vaccinated and things like that, the people that I know, I, I can trust that that is a process that is, is a whole thing. And we may just be in a pocket or we may not be because uh, there's two different views today. As a matter of fact, what was it Yale that said that we're gonna be out of the, Yale yeah. actually said that we may be peaking in September and then on our way out. I just was wanna it? give a very depressing statistic. A <laughs> oh, great. I think, <laughs> I think I'll stop.